help? First of all, there's, uh, it can help research. We know that PROMs are um, increasingly used um, for you know, RCTs to identify and measure the impact of interventions. Uh, it's drug A trial on a trial, but then drug B trial. And there's been a long history of uh, using PROMs as an outcome measure for the effectiveness and uh, cost effectiveness of many um, treatments and trials. Um, and and, and, and uh, you know, is this uh, operation better than that operation? Problems are used there. And also to evaluate the impact of policies. Um, this is more challenging and more novel, uh, but again, you can use that if there's a new policy um, and, 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 and is it, what is it, does it change outcome? And you can longitudinally measure the impact on policies. Okay. It can improve the clinical management of patients. At the individual level, clinicians may use it uh, to prompt and to support clinical care. And also, it's argued that it can improve the performance of um, services. So you can aggregate, aggregate data and incorporate it into the process measures as outcome measures, looking at quality registers and clinical audits um, data. And increasingly, there is a, a desire to do this uh, more, more routinely. So we know the use of PROMS research to, um, in research to improve care. We talked about the widespread use of PROMS in RCT already to look at interventions and policies. It's slightly more challenging. Now England have had about, it's been more than 10 years in doing PROMS routinely in elective conditions like hip and knee um, operations, hernias and varicose veins in the past. Um, and so we have some data um, from um, hip and knee um, uh, replacements um, from PROMs um, and, like, and trying to evaluate policies. There are some challenges. We know that this is, so this is a surgical rate um, in the bottom by how many hip knee operations, knee replacement operations is done. And this is mean preoperative uh, Oxford knee score. So the higher, the better their knee um, function is the lower the worse but we can hear that we can see here that actually you would think that the, those that are doing more um, area you know areas uh, ho hospitals that are doing more operations would actually um, you know, you'll be you'll be think you you'll probably expect there's actually no relationship in this in this um, figure but you might expect actually that to be less severe because you're offering way more but somehow there's no relationship between the two it's very hard to explain why unless you think you know there's when we looked at need demand and use and some of us may be oh maybe there's lots of um, unmet need so actually if you increase the rate of operations there's still lots of need so everyone is just as severely affected but are there lots of people people hiding not you know and that had there's a lot of unmet need of knee knee replacement really like i it's hard to explain but this is what the data showed we also show that hospital volume has no impact on outcome so the more um you know um hip replacement operations a hospital is doing doesn't really make them have better outcomes everyone's sort of clustered so the, there's a little bit of a flattered line, a little bit maybe, but I don't, it's no, no, not really interesting finding. Difficult to measure quality if everything is flat. Provider competition also has no impact on, on outcome. So the most competitive market and the least competitive market. So we talked about patient choice. Well, actually, it doesn't really change outcome that much for hip and knee. So there is another theory that um, PROMs can improve, you know, another aspect is that PROMs can improve clinical management of patients. And really, there are four ways PROMs can do this. First of all, it can support and improve communication. It can prompt patients to reflect on their health, support dialogue, enabling the patient to tell their story, and gives patients permission to raise issues. It's often that, you know, it's a very structured, so when you know, it validated tools, so it actually asks aspects, like a variety of aspects of particular function developed by, you know, clinical and patient consensus usually. So um, if that question comes up, it might not usually come up in the consultation. And, um, you know, research has shown particularly some uh, more sensitive um, kind of conditions like on sexual behavior, sexual health, it might not, you know, be 
immediately um, apparent to the uh, clinician to ask that question, but if it's been completed by the patient or the uh, clinician completes a prompt together, it might prompt a uh, patient to either raise it and say, oh, I saw this, I, I saw this on, as a question, I'm actually affected by it, etc. And actually en enables the patient to have a further dialogue. Um, you know, it, support, it supports greater focus on the patient's interest and, should, um, um, and the idea that it should improve the appropriateness of care. And also maybe better detection of adverse problems and adverse outcomes. So, as a, so sometimes it's used as a screening tool. It's included in the beginning of a consultation, so everybody does it. And when the clinician sees it in front of them and said, oh, well, this patient's got a, a post-operative score of much lower than the, and what I'm expected. Ah, I'm going to ask them X, Y, Z. So it can actually uh, prompt, detect, detect adverse problems. Some clinicians use it to say, uh, to help them differentiate whether or not patients should come back earlier or later for a review, for example, and, um, and, and, and hopefully also improve its efficiency for the symptom uh, system and the patient. So for example, um, monitoring long-term conditions, patients can actually log on and, 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 and complete a prom um, on repeated times to look at their own um, symptoms and also alert the clinicians to any changes in their symptoms. So, um, one of the examples is a Parkinson's.net um, in, in Denmark, and they have, um, sorry, in the Netherlands, in the in Dutch in a Dutch registry, and they have you know 50,000 patients registered and a national regional network. Um, so essentially, very concerted effort into um, focusing on patients' concerns. So patients can actually um, report their problems, outcomes, patient report outcomes, and is linked to their experience data and their clinical data. So um, Clinicians can log on, patients can log on, and it's actually, um, you know, shown that it focuses um, the care, the clinical care for these Parkinson's disease patients, to their clinical concerns. It improved patient reported, uh, you know, <coughs> outcomes. Basically, the quality of life and function has improved. It um, we you know, help prevent other uh, side effects, hip fractures, etc., and also reduce costs. Um, so, um, we have a successful network of using PROMS to manage clinical disease. As, um, the final bit is the use of PROMS to imp improve performance of services and the challenges to that. There's lots of support and encouragement for using aggregated data um, PROMS to compare different hospitals and practitioners and consider trends over time. And there is actually a belief that this will improve the quality of care. But the challenge is, the question is, ooh, how does it do that? Well, actually, PROMS is very new, and, and we let's have a, uh, you know, let's, let's think about why it, it may and how it might can. And actually, there's a lot more need to, for us to research into how we can better use it and how we can use it to improve care. Policymakers, and we said there's a clinical will, willingness to want to measure, but the reasons for how it can do that, well, it's rarely made explicit, really. So there are really the, some theories that lie behind these beliefs. Um, and these are circumstances are context dependent and how prompt data could improve care and what mechanisms um, it can to help improvement of care occur and what evidence um, we might ask to support these theories. Let's talk about these in, in turn. So first of all, the three underlying theories, supporting patient choice, improving accountability of providers, and enabling providers comparisons, benchmarking, is supposed to help improve quality. Okay. But we know that this is influenced by context. First of all, the degree to which the data is publicly disclosed. Sometimes PROMS data is kept very secret, hidden behind managers' paper files, behind uh, manage, uh, administrative uh, tasks. Oh, it's another chart there. Um, no one knows how to use it or interpret it. Use of financial incentives, very similar to the question about clinical guidelines. Oh, well, it's there. How do, do people use it? Do people use it to change their, their, um, their clinical practice? Do people use it to improve care? Same kind of questions. You know, how do we use financial incentives and sanction to support best practice? Um, perceived credibility of the data, 
something like a disrupt disruptive technology, if promise is seen as a disruptive technology, is new, the familiarity um, well, we're seeing it. Clinicians are not trained in the same way. You see a blood test, you know what to do with it. You see a PROMS data, Oxford HIP score, you might not know what to do with it unless you understand it. And if you see um, you know, your, your hospital as an aggregated data on where, how the patient's PROMS were compared to another hospital, unless you really understand how it's collected, the use of it, and understand what it's for, um, you know, that subjective measures are equally important and trustworthy, you might not see it as credible. Um, and also the extent to which the data can help uh, identify actions, and I think this is really important. Um, uh, a main point is sometimes it's not um, directly obvious for us when the relationship between outcome and what we can do to improve that outcome. Um, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. But unless, you know, for example, inputs is, you know, there's no soap and water, you can provide soap and water, and that would be an immediate change in practice. Um, but with problems, it's actually, you know, you didn't, it gives you um, a, a smoke detector, a, a detector on how it works. It might be, uh, might, what, what aspects you might want to look at, but how you would actually get it to improve. Uh, needs a deeper dive, it needs other clinical um, processes and it needs a complementary data um, and maybe a deeper dive to understand how um, to uh, decide on actions for improvement. Uh, so there are nine mechanisms by which care may improve. Let's look at this, these in turn. So we talked about supporting patient choice. We talked about improving accountability of providers by benchmarking um, and also and then enabling provider comparisons. Okay. The theories behind each is interesting. So supporting patient choice, we think that patient will choose higher performing hospitals. So in the NHS, actually, you can there is a, a, a um, patient choice, so you can choose which hospital you go to. In in practice, uh, this is, happens a lot less than we think. I mean, it depends on, the, depends on the service and it depends on also on the availability of hospitals. But usually, um, but the theory behind it is that actually patients might choose um, a hospital with a better uh, outcome, better prom, for example. Threat of loss of market share and poor, uh, poor quality providers will then exit the market. And this is much more for a market model. And in the States, certainly this is used um, a lot more. Then there is improving accountability of providers, threat of sanctions. We know that if um, you know, you, your problems fall outside certain statistical boundaries, or if you um, consistently poor, poor performers, you could, be, uh, you could uh, have a sanction, uh, <clears throat> you could have a regulator and, um, 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 sanction, you could be, you know, your service could be stopped, etc. And there could be the idea of how we can drive improvement with outcomes and enabling provider comparisons essentially this is where actually the th you know there's a lot more emphasis on now is about a prof prof professional ethos usually there's a lot of pride for pr clinical practitioners uh, to want their organizations to do well um, there if for districts as well commissioners uh, public organizations their reputation is important and so if they know that their outcomes will be published there's a drive to improve care. There's a belief that this will have focused the concerted effort to um, provide better care. <clears throat> and also the idea that you can have a peer-to-peer so -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer review, that those who are, are the best performers can help disseminate knowledge and best practice and um, influence the community in that way. So much more of a supportive, uh, perhaps, aspect to it. So different reasons, how uh, different combinations of how it might help improve care. There is uh, little um, uh, evidence for some of these. For example, patient choice, there's actually very little. Um, I've, I've already um, let you know that actually patients tend to choose, you know, it's variable, but patients tend to choose their local hospitals, at least in England. Um, they, they tend to just go to the closest one. Um, I don't know about your country, that might be different. Um, well, improving the accountability for pro providers, um, and it's uh, you know, there's some evidence on this a little bit more um, that, you know, for example, if it's a publicly reported, 
so uh, it's all transparently reported. If the clinicians accept the metrics, again, this is where you know if, clinic, if there's large clinical drive, there is, is more successful. What the financial incentives are, and if the national data is consistent with um, local data. So again, these are all context dependent. And the ability to identify actionable causes, and this is important because you know there, there's been research into you know the effects of the, the uh, effects of problems, and or some clinicians are saying, well, actually, we we know we don't we're not doing well enough, but actually, there's a lot of work to understand why we're not doing that well. And when if there's a simple change needed, then it usually leads to faster improvement. And also, there are some dangers in perverse gaming and things like that, as all data has um, when we collect and measure assessment, assessing quality. So um, when we enable provider com comparisons, we find that when clinicians own the data and it's credible to them, uh, it's much more helpful. And when, if the feedback is timely, it's, it's been said that they can do much more with it. Um, and the feedback give, put, provides advice on causes and remedies as extra bonus. So this is what the clinical community wants. So with the clinic, clinical data, if they own the data, they're able to use it more. Um, and also the desire to be seen to be good by peers and the public as a stronger um, evidence of desire. But we did mention that um, you know, when we looked at the, the the, some of the uh, data I've shown you, in, the, in England at least, there, there isn't a huge amount to say overtly that actually this has improved care or it has measured uh, differences in care. But a lot of it is maybe to do with the types of clinical intervention that PROMS is currently used. A lot of it is in effect, uh, elective care, where we know the outcomes are already very good. So mortality is very rare um, in, in hip and knee replacements, um, in elective care and generally. And we know that actually through research and through many years of collecting it, that it's a very cost-effective treatment. Um, and so probably partly to, to do with um, you know, the reasons why there's little evidence on how effective it is, is uh, based on what is being assessed. 